Okay, how are we doing? Cool. Cool. Already. The weather outside has changed so much. It was it was sunny as just before, and then it's now it's raining. Raining again. It's emotional. <laughs> the answer to everything. The weather is emotional. The weather is emotional. You think? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> and if we could all make our ways to our seats, is that okay, you yeah, guys? Wait. You're waiting. Oh, to boil, are you? Well, what if I wait for it as well? Because because it all makes background noise to our recording. So if we just uh, wait for a bit. Um, We've been having some difficulties with the recordings this trip, with the sound. Yeah, they don't seem to be working very clearly. All right, well, myself and Mary are relatively disconnected today in comparison to normal. So, so how clear channeling occurs during this, in this state is, uh, is a, is an, will be an interesting question. Yeah. <laughs> so I know that there are others of you who uh, can channel in the audience. So Sarah, you can, and obviously Christina and, and Nico, and also Katerina can. So there are quite a lot of people <laughs> who can. No, she says, no, no, no. And spent uh, an hour and a half doing it last night. Um, <laughs> so what we want to do now is just have the afternoon session now, just experimenting a bit. You see, what I feel happens a lot with people is that they're unwilling to experiment, uh, unwilling to investigate, and in particular, unwilling to experiment or investigate when it comes to spirits. They start assuming things. <coughs> Uh, with regard to the spirits and they start making assumptions often that are not valid or or um, they don't they they could easily ask questions that they don't ask uh, to find out more about certain things and so what we'd like to do is to find out more about your guides and guardians and what who le led you where and what and I think perhaps we could possibly start with some with your experience that you just described um, <laughs> to us which was, well, basically, what, you if, you, what if you describe the experience, um, if you grab that mic yeah. for us, yeah. In a, in a precede version, there was a point when you I was... a bit further apart. Yeah. When I was in California, and I felt as if the Magdalene energy was drawing me to Hawaii. Not a bad place to go, but anyway, so I was drawn there, and there were a lot of things that happened that were to do with that while I was there, from people writing books to Hawaiian elders talking about things to do with that, etc. Um, but then I also had a message <clears throat> of going to stay on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee, which I eventually did. And as I was just driving up there, not knowing why I was going to stay, because I just literally was following my guides, and um, suddenly I stopped and burst out laughing because there was a sign that said, Magdala, Hawaii. <laughs> the village of Magdala, <laughs> and the little beach there is called Hawaii Beach to this day. <laughs> so maybe I didn't need to go all the way to Hawaii, <laughs> that I could have just gone to the Sea of Galilee, <laughs> and yeah. it was that, and I was meant to go there. And that's a bit exactly Thank right. You. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. Um, so do you want to know who influenced you to do that? Yeah, was it your guide or your guide? What do you, what do you feel? What, what was your feel Life first? <clears throat> And if you just hold the mic, it's okay to hold it in your lap. That's fine. Okay. What do I feel that was influencing me? Yeah. Do you feel it was a, a guide or do you feel it was just another spirit or what do you feel? What's your personal feel? I feel it was many, I feel it was many spirits around me. Um, it feels like the push-pull push situation of some wishing me to to take me down the path of more passion and desire and others leading me into a place of my own fears of doubt, of possibility. Right, so you felt both feelings around you at the time? Or are you only describing it now? Oh, actually, thank you, just remembering. Um, 
I had some a, a challenging situation with somebody who was with me. I remember now. I'd forgotten all about that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Um, a challenging situation of someone who, um, in a way, I was a teacher for, but there was a, a <laughs> there was like this sudden change where they turned against me. Right. And, so they and I felt angry the misunderstanding you. type of thing and, and went into some grief around that. Yeah. Which perhaps I probably haven't. Fully. So, why do you feel you got led to the Sea of Galilee? Um, well, interestingly, I slept a lot of the time initially. Then it was almost as if I, I felt as if perhaps I was being downloaded with something because I really wanted to sleep an awful lot. Yeah. And it was there was um, and I felt a connection to the both of you for sure, without a doubt. Yeah. And um, a more ancient connection, and I couldn't tell you about this but I'd also seen um, a stone circle which I asked a lot of people about and eventually found up on the Golan Heights where all the army are and where it's all Mm war-torn and eventually I had experiences with that yeah Um, and there was definitely some uh, some challenging some very challenging energies around that yeah a lot of stories, but <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. So, would you like to know what actually happened? Oh, I'd love to. Yes. Okay. So, in terms of the influence and everything, and Jeez. what caused you to yes. go? So, and I've been many times, by the way, as well. Yeah. Back. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Now, do any of your do any of the mediums in the group want to bite that off? <laughs> do you feel up to biting that off, Christina? Or why is... did you bite? Uh, <laughs> it's having an Australian a colloquialism for having a go. Have a go. Have a try. Try it out. <laughs> Would you like to? Yes. You can. You can say no if you don't. Want to. <laughs> You're allowed to say no. Let's give you the mic. So to be honest, I wasn't fully listening. Yes, that's good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because he can't be misled <laughs> by what you okay. heard. Um, so, so, yeah. the, so the question I have is, which spirit with her caused her to want to go to the uh, Sea of Galilee? I still feel my fear a bit because, yeah. Because you're on the spot. Yes. <laughs> then don't do it. Okay. 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 It's okay to not do it. I've put I've put uh, Christina on the spot. <laughs> yes, I chose it. So. Well, yes, to a degree. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I will try. Yep. <clears throat> this spirit is a man. Mm-hmm. Um, um, it feels like He's connected through many generations to her, uh, what's her name, sorry? Alicia. 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 Yeah. Um, he says, like, he wanted to guide her to this place. To show her some truth about Hmm. what really happened. Um, What really happened when? Yes. During the great changes, 
what the points? He's referring to a time, the time when I was on earth in the first century. And, uh, yeah, and a lot of the spirits in the spirit world call that time the time of the great changes. Yeah. And they have, they, the time of my death was called the time of the great loss, <laughs> they call it. Okay. At that time, <clears throat> there were a lot of people who were trying to mislead others and to spread lies concerning the teachings. Mm -hmm. It was like a gang, you know, like, mm. um, it was very uh, specific, their goal. <clears throat> and the, they weren't recognized as a gang, they were like secret. Um, yes, people on earth didn't know what was happening. Yes. Yes. It felt like to other people it was like, uh, coincidences meeting these people and telling them these things. Um, they want to spread doubt and uh, this feeling of um, anakatema, uh, like uh, in Greek it's kind of like confusion, confusion, doubt. Mm -hmm. He was uh, one of the people who realized this happening and uh, tried to create another group who would balance this. Yes. <clears throat> it was like a fight uh, between these two groups. Yeah. Uh, they knew each about each other but they could never have a, um, um, fight that was seen. So it was actually undercover, like fighting for the people. Mm -hmm. like, uh, when somebody from the one who was supporting the truth, uh, seeing from the others trying to influence people, they went to these people too mm -hmm. to change them. Again. To change their mind yes. again. Yeah. So when you were there, Alicia, this is why you felt this feeling of a war or battle going on between two groups of spirits? Uh, it, I'm, just, I'm not remembering that I remember that properly. I'm feeling that now in, as if yeah. I could tap into it. There were a lot of things that, that oh, I went to Megiddo, okay. It was just before the winter solstice and I knew that I had to be at Megiddo uh, for the winter solstice, uh, before the sunrise. And I feel that that's a part of it. I couldn't, I don't. <coughs> Amy, if we could have the mic. Uh, there's only one mic, on unfortunately. On Christmas Day. <coughs> oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm not really remembering the whole thing. But, and also because there were so many things and I don't, don't want to tell all the stories. Um, my sense is now that of this of this battle I'm not sure and yes I'm absolutely sure going on mm. and uh, but I'm remembering and it feels that it's significant that I went to Megiddo um, which is where we get the Armageddon word from by yeah. the way yeah. um, on the, for the solstice and I I I spoke to three Israeli women I didn't really know them they didn't know each other but I said, I'm doing this, do you want to come? And they didn't even question, they came. Mm -hmm. uh, somehow significant. And uh, uh, I tried to find this this uh, stone circle too. They also were interested. Mm -hmm. Finally, I found it on Christmas Day mm -hmm. after having chanted across the lake, the sea for hours. Yep. And then finally I was taken to there yeah so so why do you feel that all of these influences occurred what what's your feeling as to why i felt as is uh, in this time i felt as if it was the magdalene energy awakening 
again and I'm at Peter's church. Yeah. And and every day I would go into the church and stand barefoot on the rock and just sing. Yeah. I didn't honestly know why. I just like a child, I was doing yeah. doing that. Yeah. So can you see you were being quite heavily influenced <clears throat> into doing quite a number of things that you were just going along with? I would. It was like I felt guided, and that there would be enough of a synchronicity that seemed that okay, do this. But I do remember sleeping a lot. Yeah. In that there was like three weeks. Yeah, because what I feel was happening to you is quite, um, there was quite a lot of different forces. Yes, uh, uh, a battle. It felt like it was a yeah. battle going yeah. on. Yeah. And this is uh, something that happens quite frequently with people who um, are seeking something. Mm. Quite often what happens is they get influenced in one direction by a guide or a guardian. And a lot of times, not even in the direction to visit there, but just to even think about a certain thing, mm. which they then feel they have to go there for. And then when they go there, a whole lot of other spirits kick in in the process mm -hmm. and cause you to do things you wouldn't normally probably finish up doing. And when you look back on it later, you go, I don't have any idea of why I was doing that. I just had another remembrance of, even though I wasn't directly connected, there was somebody who you know of in this world now who knew I was there and had a connection to who is um, Padma that he knew I was there. Padma, Padma knew you were there? Yeah. yeah. And I I just came to me as a... Rem not that I was doing anything and connected, but I just remember that and that yeah. feels significant. Yeah, and this is where... I actually feel there was a whole group of negative spirits influencing a lot, a lot at that time, as well as your guide trying to influence you. Mm -hmm. So your, your guide was trying to influence you in the direction of connecting to the, the divine truth at some point, and then these, all of these other spirits mm -hmm. are set up, and, and unfortunately Padma's controlled by a lot of them, and he, 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 the spirits who are involved with that are all set up about muddying the waters of the divine truth. They all want to make it all more confusing and more difficult and more difficult to understand, and they also want to make it so that, that the, the spirits who are with Padma have control of the people. Yeah. And so... Um, so at the same time, you have your guide influencing you in one direction to discover truth, but at this, uh, and, and at the same time, there's these other forces that are influencing you to, to just give up your own will and do whatever they suggest. And that's where you go into danger. When you give up your own will and do what spirit suggests, unfortunately, many times what spirit suggests can be against your desires, against the truth, and actually their will and you finish up going and doing things that are following their will rather than your own and and this is uh, and it's interesting that the spirit who led you to this place and um, actually saw all that happening 2000 years ago mm -hmm. this whole process of a war if you like in the spirit world like a war between good and evil um, but but they set themselves up even the good people set themselves up fighting against the bad people if you like which in the end proves that both of them weren't developed enough in love mm -hmm. uh, in the process. Does that make sense? Um, and, and, it's, and those influences, when you, when you were in, um, around the area of Israel, um, those influences were having a large effect on you and your willingness to give up your will was, was being engaged more and more and you could have, if, if these other guides weren't helping you, you could have quite easily given up your will completely over to the spirits who wanted you to do many other things um, other than follow the truth. Do you, do, you, do you know what I mean? And they're very uh, sexualised in nature. They, you know, they, want, they want people to go down this sexual healing route um, with regard to their spiritual development, and they call it God. Uh, and, but really it's just a connection with spirits manipulating them sexually that they call God. And, uh, and these spirits wanted to influence you down that track. Um, so it's a very, you know, so you have one, direct, one set of influences that are positive and other set of influences that are negative. And, and if you had given up your will completely, then you could be in a very different state right now. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. But you recovered your will... Yeah, yeah. Long way back. Yeah. Yeah, you recovered your will and you decided to follow what you trust as right 
rather than following what other people tell you. And that has then enabled your guides, your actual guides, to lead you to different places than they than you would have otherwise been led. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. I have the feeling that the reason that you went to Hawaii, real Hawaii first, yeah. was all about um, some female spirits who are very invested in the Magdalene energy, mm. which is not about me at all, mm. which is about a lot of anger at men. Mm and reclaiming femininity in a very angry and unfeminine way. And I feel that the reason that you ended up going to Hawaii first was so they could further connect to you, you know, and the experiences you had there were a lot about creating this connection. And then you went to um, to the Sea of Galilee and then that's how now there's a lot of influences happening on you. Yeah, mm. yeah. There is a very strong desire, it, like... On the earth at the moment, mm -hmm. there is a very strong desire for, a, for, for a, a, very, a group of very dark spirits to completely muddy the divine truth so, so much that it's unrecognisable. Mm -hmm. And the way they do it is by saying the words without there being the feeling or the action involved. So they talk the same talk without walking the same walk. And the way, and the average person, when they see that occur, they hear the words and they follow the words, not understanding that they're actually going down a path that is completely the opposite of truth and leads you into a part, place of, uh, it can lead you into a place of a lot of darkness. And, um, and this is one way that the spirits even now are using to muddy the waters of what is being taught with regard to the truth so that they can influence people very, very negatively and also influence large groups of people to not listen because all they need to do is provide examples that are really bad you know, of people who are claiming that they are receiving divine love and then looking at their life, they see that, wow, that person is quite dark or that person does these different things and then it <coughs> becomes a bad example and then, and then they show that bad example to the world and say, see, this is what this divine truth does. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a great way of completely muddying the waters of truth on, on the earth. Um, the, the reality is that, that anything to do with, with sexual awakening in the sense that, uh, that someone like Padma is promoting has a large degree of influences that are very dark in nature about degrading our condition uh, sexually and therefore at, at our soul level too. And, and these influences also, the, the, uh, the spirits guiding these influences, want there to be a misrepresentation of divine truth on the earth uh, so that they can point at that and say, don't follow it because these people are following it and look what's happening to them. When those people that they're pointing at are not following at all and in fact are following something completely different. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. This is already five years ago. Yeah, but it's still happening today. <coughs> still oh, still oh, happening right. today. Yeah, I'm not saying it's happening to you. I've seen, I've <laughs> but, seen the communicator. <laughs> yeah, it's still happening today. So, um, And the, the, the spirits are totally engaged in trying to destroy any semblance of truth on earth. Because if they do that, they can maintain their control. They can maintain the control of people. If I could just make a point about discerning who is guiding you, if you're interested in having a divine love guide, divine love guides will never place a heavy emphasis on symbols, on signs, on certain rituals or practices, on historical sites, on any of those things. Because they don't matter to them. None of those things matter to them. They may, like, uh, synchronicity. I can't say the word. They may arrange something to trigger a feeling within you or a thought within you, but they will never encourage you down the way of having a certain ritual or practice or placing a certain emphasis on a symbol or an energy or any... Because really they're interested in your soul, its growth and connection with God. And you don't need any of those things for, those, for that to occur. So you don't need symbols or rituals or sacred sites or anything because God created us all as a potential sacred site to receive divine love wherever we are. So um, mm. that's just an, an interesting way to analyse who's, who's guiding you. 
Well, that, that's a pretty big question for me then. If I, <laughs> I would like some help and guidance with that because my journey has been traveling around the world, taking people and going to many sites. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe I would like a little guidance, therefore, in where am I at now? So the first question I would ask myself yeah. is, why am I connected to sites? What, what uh, does well, the, part, yeah, part, what's yeah. the feeling in me mm -hmm. that causes me to have this gravitation, this pull towards sacred or holy places, yeah. so-called sacred or holy places on the planet? Because from God's perspective, mm -hmm. there is no single place on the planet that's more holy than another, mm -hmm. right? From God's perspective. And from our celestial friend's perspective, there is no single place on the planet that's more holy than another mm -hmm. because they see the significance in each place. And even that, that applies even to the Middle East. Like mm -hmm. I don't, I'm often asked well, about, um, in terms of my life, like, whether I find the Middle East a significant place for my life. Well, aside from the fact that I grew up there in the first century, there is no other significance to me. It's just another place on Earth uh, that things happened, just like there are many other millions of places on Earth where things happened. And, and some of those things uh, involved quite large universal issues at the time of my living in the first century, but just now, there's quite large universal issues being uh, resolved in a lot of different locations on the planet, and, uh, and yet none of us view those particular pl places as holy or sacred. And, so, and that's the case with all of our celestial friends as well. So whatever draws us to these sites has to be something quite different than our celestial friends. So the key is to look at what it is. Right? It begins with an emotion inside of ourselves what do we feel when we're there now understand that what you feel when you're at a certain location is heavily influenced by the spirits that are at the, lo the, the location and you feel a connection with them so what would cause you to feel a connection with certain spirits who are nostalgic for example mm -hmm. there has to be a feeling within you that's nostalgic mm -hmm. that that's looking for something in the past if mm -hmm. you like so the key is to look through your life and discover the emotion that's present mm -hmm. that causes this nostalgia feeling to be satisfied when you go to a certain location. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So can you feel the nostalgia feeling inside of you that you feel gets resolved every time you go to a site that's sacred? Or can you feel a feeling that other people have that you like to see them have when they go to a certain site? Can you see there's two different emotions there? If you take other people to the same location, mm -hmm. often it's about the feeling you, you get, seeing the other person go through mm -hmm. a feeling or feeling the other person go through a feeling of their own. Can you feel what that feeling is inside of yourself? You can turn the mic around. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I may... Uh, I, I'm not feeling. I'm obviously, I'm in resistance. I'm not feeling it There's completely a right now in you about it, yeah. um, because it's such a. It's been such a huge part of my life from taking groups without even planning to go to those places. When did it? When did it begin? When did the the desire to do this begin? Um, to travel, grandmother. Off travel, <laughs> University of Life. Um, Your grandmother said. Yeah, to you. I'm. I mean, I'm. Uh, some reason I'm maybe it's just because you're here. I'm very I keep being aware of Uluru, so I'm <laughs> like interesting. Uh, it was a yeah, it was just yeah, she did. She said, Go off and travel, it's yep. the university of life instead of going to university. university. Yeah, so what so that was that, that was an, emotionally that was like, oh, Not good enough to do this, I'll do this, right. So there's a huge emotion involved in not having grandma's yeah, no. approval. No, the opposite. Or having grandma's, grandma's approval, approval to go. If you go off in the University of Life. Yes. Yeah. That yeah. was the first sort of going to travel. And yep. I didn't think of it as sites at the time. It just sort of came as a part of it. Yeah. Going to many places. And, and it has definitely been an influence on me. Yeah, so like what I feel from you guys is what they're trying to say, what they've been trying to do is they've been trying to lead you away from this, what they feel is an addiction. Mm 
mm-hmm. and into finding out the truth by using your addiction to oh, discover okay. things mm-hmm. that eventually bring you to more truth. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. And often they do this. Well, because, yeah, that's, that's what's happening. Because that's yeah. all they've got to work with, right? Yeah. So, so what they do is they... The, so the addiction to go to travel, which was driven by the approval of grandma, yeah. um, it draws you into travel. And then they utilise that desire for travel mm-hmm. um, in an attempt to address the emotion or mm-hmm. eventually get to address the emotion inside of yourself that leads you to truth and in the process reduces the original addiction mm-hmm. in the end. And, and this is what our spirit friends often try to do to us in an attempt to help us with discovering more truth but also in an attempt to release us from the spirit influence we're under while we're in our addiction. Mm -hmm. And I feel you've been in quite heavy spirit influence at times because you were willing to completely abdicate your own will Mm -hmm. in this process. And when you're willing to completely abdicate your own will, give it away, Mm -hmm. then you leave yourself completely open to being influenced by much darker influences. Mm -hmm. The brighter spirits will not influence you when you abdicate your own will. The brighter spirits do not then take control of your life because they want you to have your own will. Mm -hmm. One of the whole reasons why you're here on the planet is to embrace your own will, to learn Mm -hmm. how to embrace your free will. So every time you abdicate your will, and I see a lot of people who are in new age sort of circles abdicating their own will very frequently, giving giving themselves away. Almost. Becoming fascinated with this idea of a guide and guidance mm. and signs, and and then before they know it, th- their life is just totally run by those things mm-hmm. instead of first connecting with desire and letting that lead, mm-hmm. and then being guided. Because remember, your desires, if they're harmonious with love, they are very different than if they are harmonious with addiction. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so whenever we follow a desire that ends up being an addiction we will often abdicate our own control of ourselves even and we will allow other influences to come and push us in certain directions yeah. that if we had our own will, we would never agree to. Mm. Yep. Um, we, we know of a man in Australia who, when I first met him, he would abdicate his own will every single morning. He'd get up and he'd say to what he called the universe, what do you want me to do today? Yeah. And whatever messages he got, he did that day. Oh, well, that's me. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm really, let my will be aligned with that. Yeah. I can definitely yeah. put my hand up to that. And, yeah. and what that does is open you completely mm. to more malevolent spirits guiding your will. Because uh, a divine love guide or a guide who's in a lo- condition of love, any guide who's in a condition of love, will mm. not want you to abdicate your own will. They want you to learn how to use your will in harmony, in harmony yeah. with love. Yeah. It's interesting because it's a sort of more for me almost like I've got a boat with a sail and I want, I'm, I'm wanting and to get aligned, wind blows aligned with that, aligned with the wind, but I'm in current control of the sails. It's interesting to, to stir that up. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. And when you are fully embracing your free will, Mm -hmm. you are not very open at all to spirits telling you what to do or abdicating your will to spirits. You will be guided by, when you're guided by your guides or your guardians, what happens is that they give you, they, all of their messages they give you are completely harmonious with your passions and desires. Mm -hmm. They don't want you to abdicate your passions and desires and do what they want because to do that would mean that you're only becoming a puppet Mm. of another person rather than knowing yourself. Mm. And this is the problem we see in most New Age spirituality. There is this desire to abdicate the will, Mm. give it up. Even in favour of God's will. Yeah. When the truth is God's will is that you have your will. Have your will. That's (laughs) That's why he gave you That's his greatest desire. Yeah. yeah, so God will never tell you what to do. God will say, what is your desire? Is it loving? Go for it, you know. The, and if it's not loving, I'll correct it. Yeah, uh, I'll let you know. Laws, I'll correct yeah. it. Yeah, so. so. So one of the things to look at quite strongly for yourself in your mm-hmm. life is is to to begin to get back this desire to understand your own desires. What do you want to do? Rather than sort of being blown about here and there, 
by the forces of nature, let's call it, but it's really yeah. spirit forces, rather than being blown about, allow yourself to connect with what do you desire to do? What are your real passions and desires? Because I actually feel Alicia's really not yet fully discovered them, mm. right? Because you've abdicated your will for such a long time. It's been very difficult oh, yeah. for you to I've know I've had what conversations that. this week about that, so perfect. Sorry, awesome. I feel like I've hogged the, no, no, the time a, a little. Yeah. So, so do you understand the issue? So do not... I think it's good for us to see what's going on here because, because there, whenever we have a tendency to talk about guys and guardians, there is this tendency that people have that they think they know what we're speaking about yeah. and that they think that it's happened in their life when in reality they haven't been guided by their guide or guardian, they've actually been guided by very negative influences mm. who want them to abdicate their will. Mm. Mm. And that is not the same as what your guides and guardians are attempting to do with you. Your guide and guardian do not want you to abdicate your will. They want you to embrace your will. And when you embrace your will with passion, they will be able to help you have that will satisfied if it's harmonious with love. Mm. And if it's not harmonious with love, they will help you through the same process, see, oh, it's not harmonious with love here, and I can address that. And so it's always going to be something that's building on itself. So you're always going to be growing in knowledge that complements the previous knowledge you had, and you're, you're growing towards more and more truth. It won't be like, oh, I landed here, that must be because I should have had some experience. I don't really understand it. Oh, I'll go to the next place. Oh, I just had another experience. And, and I know a lot of New Age is sort of typified by that um, thing of we can't understand and it's just good and it must have been for some sole purpose that we, you know, a lot of language that <coughs> doesn't really resolve anything, any meaning in our life. Mm. Whereas... Um, Your guides want to have resolution of every issue. Yeah. Mm. They want you to know why you went to a certain place. They want you to get think, yeah, and that's <coughs> taught me this about this, you know, and mm. or God or the way the the way I am or, or whatever, yeah. Yeah, your guides are not mysterious. Mm. They are very down to earth, practical people. They they want to show you exactly what's going on every single time. It's it's the spirits who are in darkness or darker places who love mystery. They want you to abdicate your will and to give it up to mystery. And God is totally desirous of you knowing all truth. Darker spirits want you to know no truth. Mm. They want you to just abdicate your will to mystery so that they can then manipulate you in, in any direction they want you to go. That's their underlying purpose. So, so every time we abdicate ourselves, abdicate our desires and our will, we are giving ourselves over, unfortunately. Now, our guides will still try to work with that, which your guides have done. But, but we, they, who knows, that if, if you didn't abdicate your will right at the beginning with your grandma, <laughs> and you might have gone down a different track, which mm. meant discovery of truth sooner. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, um, it, you don't really know, because once you abdicate your will, then you're really under where the wind blows you. Even though you feel like you're following your own will and you feel like it's building because that makes sense mm -hmm. to me as well. I can see that building, yes, go there, and that builds on that and that builds on that, even mm -hmm. though you can see all of that. Yep. And that's the truth, except there's also influences at the same there's time. There's also the negative influence at the same yeah. time. So your guides are working on you with regard to the truthful influences to bring you to a place, mm -hmm. which they have done quite well considering all the negative influences yeah. that have been there, plus your own abdication of your will. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and, and this is where it's, we have to appreciate our guides because yeah. it just demonstrates that, that even if we take a direction that's quite like giving up will and all sorts of other things, in the end they pull us around to finish mm -hmm. up saying truth anyway. And this is um, the beauty of our guides and we have to have a lot of appreciation for their effort because uh, without their effort none of those things mm -hmm. would have probably occurred. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Is there any questions about what I, I just... Thought you had some <laughs> Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah. Can everyone see the importance of not giving up your will? Can everyone see that? 
I think it's an important distinction between being guided and giving up your will, isn't it? Totally. A lot of people feel that when you're guided, you're just going to be given a checklist. Oh, when I have a good relationship with my guides, they'll just tell me. Go here, go there, go there, go there. And it's not how it's going to work. It's not how it's going to work at all. And if it is working that way, I'd be very suspicious (laughs) of who it is that's influencing me to think that way. Because the, the reality is that God placed us on this earth for, for a couple of purposes. The first primary purpose is so that we would come to experience her love. The second primary purpose so that is that so that we'd come to experience ourselves as God intended us to be in terms of our full blown creation, the creation of ourselves. Now now if you abdicate your will, you will never get the second one. Ever. You will never come to know yourself. You are only going to know what everybody else wants. You're never going to come to know yourself if you abdicate your own will. So it's very important to understand that your free will is one of these primary gifts that God has given you to utilise how you wish. But don't give it up. Don't give it away to other people. Embrace it for yourself. Yeah, Nico, just hang a sec with the mic. About free will, it's the gift of God to humanity in order to it's the gift of God to me so I can find who I am it's not only so you can find who you are but it's also so you can begin to understand love without free will love cannot exist you see love comes as an emotion from the heart from the heart of an individual given to another individual without free will there is no possibility of love existing because if free will doesn't exist, there is no desire in me. I, won't, I wouldn't have a self-actualized desire to love you. Do you understand? Yeah. It's very important to understand this relationship between free will and love. Love cannot exist without the gift of free will. No, I get it. Yes? So, so every time you give up your free will, you, you are also love. giving up love. You are giving up the potential of you loving another and another loving you for being you. You see? So, so if I now give all of my will over to Mary, and whatever Mary says I do, then who can you love? When you love me, you're not loving me. You're loving Mary. Because I'm the one, I've abdicated my will to Mary. You're now loving Mary. You're not really loving me. If you, even if you think you love me, you're only getting what has been modified by Mary. Uh, even if I say I love you, I'm not loving you. No. <laughs> yeah, I'm loving my demands getting met. And she's loving herself, really, yeah. <laughs> but not me. So, so, so the issue is love cannot exist between us if I give up my will for Mary or Mary gives up her will for me. Love can only exist if I own my will and a part of that desire inside of me is that I want to love Mary, I will love Mary. And then... My will is being exercised to love Mary. Mary will then feel it as my feelings for her rather than feeling it that I'm doing something for her. She will feel it as my feelings for her. Can you see the dif- dis- distinction? And this is something that we need to understand with free will. Every time we give up free will, we, we take away from ourselves the ability to love. Every single time. And this is when people often ask us, well... What about God's will for us? The same applies. If you give up your will to do what you believe is God's will, then you're no longer, God can no longer love you because because you've given up your will. You've given up your sense of yourself. God can only then love what she has created in you um, rather than loving you. When you own your own will, now God can love you. Because you are an individual. You are someone who can receive God's love when, when you are in the action of feeling your own will. And this is, uh, I feel, a big issue for many religions. Many religions encourage you to give up your own will. Right? It makes me laugh when people say to me that I'm creating a cult. Because if I'm creating a cult, I'm creating a cult that has a, every single person in it has their own will. <laughs> Uh, to me, that can't be a cult anymore because every single person is going to do what they will, not what I will, for them. Does that make sense? And this is very important. God created you to engage your will. 
God also created you to experience love. And if you engage your will in a loving manner, now you can experience many beautiful things. And if you engage your will to love God and receive God's love, now you can experience even more beautiful things. But it has to be with your will. And this is where I feel many spirits uh, muddy the waters. They actually try to get you to think that giving up your will is following God. And that is not true. God would not give you the gift of free will only to take it away again in order to worship God. Can you see? Why would God do that? God gave you the gift of free will so that through your own choice you could decide to worship God if that's what you want to do. And God also gave you the free will that you could decide not to worship God if that's what you wanted to do. And both are available to you if you exercise your will. And this is where I feel it's very important to understand that with regard to spirits. Every time you deactivate your own will, you place yourself in danger of being manipulated by another person. Whether that person is on earth or in the spirit world, doesn't matter. You are placing yourself in their hands. You don't need to do that. And you definitely don't do that on the divine love path. Yeah. So it's like the analogy we gave of the crossroad earlier. And if you're standing at the crossroad and you go, God, which way is it? Which, what's your will for me to go? God's not going to answer, but some spirit likely is. And go, go left, you know, go right, whatever. <laughs> Whereas if you actively engage your desire and your action, which was one of the points that your guides all said to you, you, you take a step for yourself, your will is engaged, and then your guide can can give you feedback, which is not based on, no, don't do that, but, you know, there's danger here or it's better that way, but you're still engaging your will. Mm -hmm. And there's a huge distinction that I feel I'm not probably under, like explaining very well, but, no, yeah. The, the whole thing that Mary said, you're in a crossroads, you say to God, please tell me where to go, and... If God created a system that you have to activate your own will, when you're going, please tell me where to go, God, how can God answer that question? Because to answer that question, God would have to break her own gift to you by telling you where to go. Do you understand? The gift of free will is a gift God's given you, and so God would have to, to break that gift and tell you where to go. In other words, you'd no longer have your own will to decide where to go. Now, God can't do that. God won't do that. And any spirit who steps in and, and does it is certainly not harmonious with God. They're out of harmony with God. We have the mic back there. Thanks, Arthur. Just, Just right, in the right back in the corner. Okay. Bit nervous. That's okay. Lots of anxiety. Um, your free will is pretty heavily influenced I feel in your day-to-day -day life by your circumstances your family your work situation society there's so many things that influence free will I feel personally because if you um, really follow your desires you probably wouldn't do half the things that you do every day so how do you fit that into your life well you don't fit it into your life. What you do is you address the emotional reasons why you abdicate your will to society, to family, to friends, to work, and you stop doing that in your life. That's what you need to do. So, so this, is, this is how we learn about free will. You see, when we, when we come into the world, we, we often are so... Uh, the world, the environment we're coming into is so controlled that we automatically learn to abdicate our will. But as we grow, we need to stop abdicating our will and deal with the emotional reason why we have abdicated our will in our past. So every time you abdicate your will to your family, you are out of harmony with what God desired for you to do. Every time you abdicate your will to your friends, you are out of harmony with what God desired you to do. Every time you abdicate your will to society, you are out of harmony with what, what God desired for you to do. What we need to do is we need to see that and then look at the emotional reason inside, which is always fear, 
that caused us to do it. And we need to finish up releasing these fears so that we don't do it anymore. So, so in the example you give, you say that you feel that we don't really have as much free will as we should have. Mm -hmm. Is that not true? Yeah, that's true. And, and it, that is very true. We, we, we don't exercise our free will as much as we should. We have it because we have we're it. using it to please everyone else. So we're, doing, we're using our will. It's just that we're using it against what we desire. And for other people, we're using it to please them. So in other words, we are conforming our will to other people. So unfortunately, most of us are living in a cult. It's the cult of yes. Family, it's the cult society, of family, the cult career. of society, the cult of culture, the cult of religion, the cult of all these different cults. We're living in them constantly because we're refusing to actually address the fear we have inside of us as to if we do something different to that, how we'll be looked upon, how we'll be attacked, how we'll be controlled, how we'll be viewed or treated, how we'll be judged. And we're so afraid of all of those things, attack, judgment, and so forth. We're so afraid of them that we automatically now learn to abdicate our will and give it to the people who we feel have the power to judge us. Give it to the people who we feel have the power to attack us, and so forth. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And what we need to do is challenge that. And if we all challenge that, and everybody in a society challenged that, then the society would be severely challenged for a period of time. And then after that, everyone would start recognising, you're allowed to do what you want. I'm allowed to do what I want, as long as what we both want is harmonious with love. So, so you can do anything you want, as long as it's harmonious with love, and the society would accept what you're doing. You can do other things that are out of harmony with love, and the society will attempt to correct you in some way. But it won't be based on what the society fears, it'll be based on love. And that's the difference. And if we can do that, and have the courage to do that in our day-to-day -day life, it needs a few people to start the process, right? If we have the courage to do that, then other people will look at it and go, oh, they're doing that. Well, I didn't realise you could do that. I might do that too. And then more people would go, oh, wow, isn't this amazing? They're doing that. I'm not doing that, but I could do that. <laughs> And at the moment, the majority of us don't even feel we can do it because, because society or our religion or our family or our friends or whatever control us so much and we abdicate our own free will to allow this control and, and we're so afraid of disappointing any of them that we don't actually engage our will completely. And that's what I feel is a very sad part of human society. But as you go through the spirit world, you learn to embrace your will and you learn to embrace it without what anybody else thinks of you so you get to a point in the spirit world if you don't do it before on earth where you will in fact be doing things that all of your family disagrees with you doing and you'll still go ahead and do with it mm. you'll still do it because you've now engaged your will fully yeah Does that make sense? Yeah. very good question mm -hmm. very good question yeah and, and the danger when we talk about spirits is that spirits love people who abdicate their will. Because that means a spirit, I mean a spirit who's in a dark place, a spirit who's in a dark place can then can use you to get what they want from you. And this is how many people become drunkards. It's how many people become drug addicts. It's how many pe people you know, die from all sorts of diseases because of different addictions all because they, it began with abdicating their will, you know, giving their will up. Mm. Yep. The cult of family <laughs> is the strongest force that causes us to give up our will. That is one of the strongest forces on the planet for giving up your will. More, much more strong than religion or politics or any other form of of you know, forcing a person or control. The cult of family causes... It's with us from the moment we're conceived and by the time we're three or four years of age, we accept it as if this is what we have to do. We have no choice. And we do have still choice. It's just that we don't believe we have choice anymore. That's the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Far away.
maybe we'd be better off without money. <laughs> <laughs> is that not one of the things that instills fear in us, that when you have family, you have responsibility, how can you step out and follow your free will when you have all these responsibilities and you're going to run down a, po a path of poverty, probably, for all the people who you're responsible for? Well, we need to understand that it's our emotions that create our lack at any one point in time. So, so if I take full personal responsibility for my life, I will realise that if I do not have money, it is, in other words, the necessities to live, it's not because I'm following my desires, but rather because I have emotions within me that cause me to reject the funds needed to follow my desires. So if I am willing to feel those emotions, I will actually get to a point where I receive money. If money is what is the way in which I can obtain things to live. Now, in the future, money may not be the way that we obtain things to live. But even if it is, as long as I address the emotion that I feel towards money, I will always finish up receiving it whether it matters to me or not. Do you understand? I and <laughs> You definitely don't understand. <laughs> and that's okay. No, I don't know if I understand. Yeah, yeah. that's okay. Um, if I can explain, in, in, give you an example in my own life. Um, when I started going around the world teaching people, I had uh, money that I had created myself through business and through uh, development, property development, yes? And in the first five years of my travelling around with people, um, I spent all of that money. All the money that I obtained, I, got, I sold my property and I used the profits from my property to pay for me to go travelling and so forth and I spent that and, and then I spent it giving away books or DVDs or other things. like so. And in fact, I paid for other people even to do the same thing. Yeah, that's one of the ways I gave away this money. But in the end, I ended up with no money. Why did I end up with no money? Because I had some emotions I had to work through about money. Now, once I started working my way through the emotions, I found I had some pretty big emotions about money. Um, some of them were associated with my first century existence and my death even, that I had to work my way through emotionally. I also had some emotions regarding this life and a feeling of rebellion that I had inside of myself that I recognised about money, not wanting money to be a part of the commodity that the world uses. And so I had anger about that that I had to address. And then I had some sadness about that and grief, personal grief that I had to address. Once I let go of all of those things emotionally, I started receiving donations from people who just gave me money. Now, I didn't do anything different. I still went around teaching people and still did all the same things. But now I was receiving money from people so that I could do it. Up until that point, I didn't receive any money from anybody to do it. Does that make sense? I had to actually process something emotionally that caused my soul to reject money before the money would come to me. And this is something that we don't understand about responsibility. We are all responsible for our own creations once we become an adult. If we have a lack of money, it's not because of anything else. It's not because of the, the social system. It's not because of the environment we live in. It's not because there's no work. It's not any of those things. It's something to do with an emotion inside of our soul that we need to address. When we address it, the situation will change. Now, I've seen this happen over and over and over again in my own life. It's something I practice, as Mary knows, every single moment of my life, right? But in the beginning, I didn't do that. In the beginning, I just thought, why isn't this happening? You know, I'm trying to do good here. Why isn't there any money coming along? You know, like that kind of thing. Not realising that it was my own creation. Something that I had to change within me that would change the attraction, that would bring me different things. Once I addressed those things emotionally, then I had different things come, but only then. Only then, not before then. Before then, I did all my hardest and spent all this money that I'd previously earned using different techniques and so forth. 
and I ended up with very little money left and uh, and certainly not enough money to live week by week and uh, and then I had to address the emotion at last <laughs> because I had none and I had to work through why I had none for the first time up until then I had money because I worked hard and like I used to work sometimes 18 to 20 hours a day um, and sometimes over 100 hours a week plus generally every single week and so naturally that draw, drew me money but it didn't draw me much else <laughs> I had no other time to do anything I wanted and no other time to do anything I loved and I was totally abdicated my will to the system that gave money <laughs> once I stopped doing that that system didn't give me money anymore and I had to work out why and I found it was a soul it was an emotional thing inside of me that attracted that lack. Yeah? When you address that emotionally, now things will change. Only then. It won't happen before then. And you can work hard and you might get some money, but until you deal with the emotions inside of yourself, you will not be able to embrace your desires and passions and also receive money doing it. So this is where it's really good for us all to think about too. We could embrace our desires and passions and the instant you do that, many of you will instantly find you don't have enough money. Does that make sense? It happened just before coming. Yeah, okay. And, and in that moment, you can then realise, well, hang a sec, there's something inside of me that creates this lack. If I address the emotion inside of me that creates the lack, then I will also receive money by following my passions and desires. Now, there's been many people who are now quite famous and rich in the world who have got lots of money as a result of following their desires and passions only. And initially, they were broke. And they had to deal with their emotions about being broke. They went through many feelings. You, you talk to many of these people who are now rich, you'll find that the ones that are not working hard, that money seems to come to them quite easily just by following their passions and desires, every single one of them went through a space where they had no money. Every single one of them. And they had to address it emotionally. They had to feel it. And when they felt it, when they dealt with that emotionally, then they started, they still stayed on their passion and desire. They still did what they wanted to do, but now they received money while they were doing it. Every single person that I've spoken to has been So like it's that. just a case of getting through that moment of the rent's overdue, I'm going to stay on this track, it'll happen. That then deals with the emotion? No. Is it the fear is the first one you have to deal with? The fear, and the fear of having nothing, of course, but under the fear is the grief. But there may be also, for a lot of people there is rage. There's rage at the system, rage at the system of money inside of many of us. Many of you, when you get a bill, how do you feel? It's not like, oh, isn't this a beautiful bill? <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank, thank you for providing my electricity. I would love to give that money to that person. Most of us don't feel that, do we? What do we feel? If we're honest, we feel, oh, why is that so much? Why is electricity something that's essential for me now, living in where we live? So much money, you know, and we complain and we get bitter. These are all the emotions that are preventing money from coming to us that have now been triggered by the reception of this bill. And I have the ability in this moment to find them and feel them. Or I can skip over and say, everything's going to be all right. Now, I call that skipping over. Yeah. It might not be all right. You may be destitute. <laughs> feel that. Oh, okay. <laughs> you fake see? it till you make it. No, no don't, don't fake it. it. <laughs> don't fake it. <laughs> Give freak up. out. <laughs> if you need to freak out, freak out. Feel the feelings and then feel what's underneath them. Underneath them is usually a lot of, uh, there's a lot of anger that we have about this system we live in. Many of us are very angry with how the monetary system works. Many of us, you think about your day to day life, how you feel when you get a bill that you cannot pay. How do you feel then? Don't you feel terrified, many of you? To terrified that you've now got a bill that you cannot pay. So there's a lot of fear of this system as well. Fear, anger, two very strong preventions of having money come into your life. Right? And then you might find this grief. You see, many of us had a childhood where mother and father argued about money all the time. 
we don't even see money as having money or having a lack of it as anybody being able to love anymore. We almost feel like love is dependent upon whether we're financially secure or not. Many of us believe this because of our childhood. Because in our childhood, we had mum and dad arguing about, fighting about money all the time. No love in that place. And, and so whenever we think about money, we think of arguments. And, and lo and behold, in our own life, often there's arguments whenever we think about money or whenever we've engaged with money. And so we have all of these emotions involved that unless we release them, we will not change the issue. We will still have a lack in our lives as a result of these emotions. But when you deal with the anger, and you, when I say deal with it, you feel it. You need to feel it and, and, and embrace it. Embrace it. Feel the fear. Embrace it. Allow yourself to grieve. So when you get that bill you cannot pay, many of you feel like crying, but you don't let yourself do it. Right? But if you let yourself do it, you'll be surprised what happens after that. <laughs> yes? But we don't let ourselves do it because we go, oh, it's not growing up <laughs> to cry about a bill. <laughs> it's not growing up to cry about, you know, not having enough. We've got to go out and create more. So we become more self-reliant, we become and we also less resistive to more sorry, more resistive to our emotions. We're we're less inclined to feel them. When we feel them, we have a, we have the possibility of changing everything. Yeah. Very important to understand that. Yeah. Sarah? So you just reminded me of something that happened when I was a student um, and didn't have much money and um, I got I got pulled over for speeding mm -hmm. and the guy went to write a ticket and I just started to cry because I just didn't have the money. And he was like, oh, all right. And he changed the ticket. So he said he started writing it, otherwise he would have ripped it up, but he, but he changed it so it was a much cheaper fine. Like, just like that. But yeah. just because I just, I, I seriously was so upset. I was like, yeah. I don't have any money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, when, and it's amazing like that. When you embrace the emotion, the actual emotion you feel, not the anger, like, so yeah. not the anger or the fear, but the actual feeling, which is, what am I going to do? You know, this terrible feeling of, like, all, all sorts of emotions come, all related to grief generally. When you embrace that grieving emotion, you heal something in yourself, and right at that same instant, you change what can happen. Mm. Right at that instant. Yeah. What, what happens changes. And, and when you embrace your tears in a public setting, <laughs> and it's true tears, not fake. Not no, manipulating. I not no, manipulated, I was you know? sad. <laughs> when you embrace your... You change what happens around you very, very rapidly. Mm. Yeah? Most of us are totally unwilling to do that. Mm. So, so because we want to maintain a facade, we want to be nice and calm, we want to give the impression that everything's fine when it's not, and so we feel embarrassed or humiliated or some other thing, that, and then we don't allow ourselves to feel the grief that we actually need to feel, and then nothing changes, and things just get harder. <laughs> That's exactly what happens. Yeah. yeah. Good question. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very important to understand that our soul creates everything, not, not externals. Our soul creates everything. When we're an adult, our soul creates everything. When we're a child, it's our parent's soul that creates everything. <laughs> you understand? And as we grow, we change from our parent's soul creating everything to our own soul creating everything. So by the time we're an adult like we are, our soul is now creating. Every negative experience I'm having right now, my soul creates. Every positive experience I have right now, my soul creates. If I allow myself to embrace the process emotionally, I can heal the negative experiences, and then every experience my soul creates can only be positive. Now, most of us don't trust that. So what we do instead, what we do instead is we go, I don't trust that. That's a stupid idea. Who thought of that crazy idea? And what we do instead is we go, no, the only thing that's going to change anything is if I work hard to change it. Now, many of you have already tried working hard and did it work as well as you thought it should. <laughs> For many of you, it hasn't right? <laughs> worked as well as you thought. And the reason why is because your own soul is working against the hard work that you're doing. Do you understand? Your own emotions are working against what you're trying to achieve. 
So many of you think where by going to work five days a week, you're creating money. How many of you have money that you're happy with? Did it, did it create money for you, this going to work five days a week? Did it create amount of money that you desired? Not as much as you thought, probably. Now, I know many people, and at one point in my life, I was in the same position, and I am now in the same position, where that work very little in a... In fact, I don't work at all anymore. Like, for a person, I just go around doing these free things all the time. That's all I do. And yet I've got enough money. So how did that happen? Well, it happened by releasing the emotions that I had to release to create that. That's how it happened. By putting into practice what I'm teaching you. That's how it, how it happened. Not by me working very, very hard. There was a time when I worked very, very hard. As I said, hundreds of 100 hours a week plus every single week. Didn't have a holiday for nearly seven years during that time. 100 hours a week, every week, no holiday, seven years. And I created a degree of wealth, but as soon as I embraced my passion and desire, what happened to it all? Went away. <laughs> Within a three, of three years, four years, it was all gone. It was all gone. And that tells me that, that I hadn't dealt with the emotion. I had to work hard, and at the same time, my soul was repelling. If I, if I had worked hard and my soul was not repelling, imagine how much I could have created. A huge amount, if I wanted to. Nico. In my last job, I felt being used from my boss, exploited, to mm -hmm. be honest. It just came to me that it's the same feeling with my parents because yes. it's not my boss. Okay, the boss exploits me, but I have the choice: stay or go. Yes, I choose to to leave. Yeah, but you can see, though, can't you, the relationship between what your boss was projecting at you and what your parents project at you? Exploitation of me. Yeah. Uh, my boss in the physical level to work hard so he can eat and have pleasures. Yes. My parents to avoid being triggered and feeling great. It's the same, feeling great. Yeah, exactly. So, my... so can you see the boss that you attract is even about the parents you have that you haven't released emotionally? Yeah. So the, the feeling you have towards your parents needs to be released emotionally. And then you won't attract the same boss. In fact, what you'll do is very different things. Now, can I give you a few illustrations of this of people who have done these things? My son Tristan is 28 years old, right? He, uh, he was about, about two years ago. He, um, he had no job and he hadn't been to university. He failed his last two years at high school. So, so he, he failed two years of high school when he was at high school and he was now 26 years old and the only place that he had ever worked was at a supermarket or, um, or working as a labourer. They were the only two places he'd ever worked. Tristan had not engaged his desires. He didn't know what he wanted to do. He worked out what he wanted to do, and he's always really known what he wanted to do. He just felt he couldn't do it. But he worked out that what he wanted to do was work with children, and in particular, teenage or young teenage children who were disturbed, troubled. troubled. And so, so what Tristan did was he began to engage his desire. What he did was he volunteered to work at a place in the local community. There were no jobs in the local community for, the, for, for him because he needed to have a qualification before anybody would hire him. So nobody would hire him. So, so what he did was he decided to work voluntary doing the job. So he volunteered his time 30 hours every week. To, and he loved it. And he loved it. He loved just volunteering his time. So he loved it so much that after four months of volunteering his time, 
So now we're talking up to recently, after four months of volunteer's time for that amount of time, 30 hours every week, which is a solid amount of time, he demonstrated his passion to the people he was working with. And they decided to create two positions, two jobs, and Tristan could have his choice of any one of them, even though he had no qualifications. The only thing they asked of him was that he did one, one uh, module unit, yeah. or unit of a course that would eventually give him a qualification. And all he has to do is one module, a few hours a week of a course, and he can do that for the next 10 years and he'll have the job. <laughs> That's all he has to do. They're, because of his passion... And, and now, like, he goes to work more often than they want him to go to work because he still, loves, <laughs> he still loves doing it, right? He loves doing what he's doing. And to him, it's not even a job. Like, now somebody's paying him to do something that he was voluntarily doing before. Does that make sense? Yeah. Just because he firstly chose to deal with the emotions inside of him that caused him to not actually do it voluntarily. So there was emotions he had to work through as to why he wasn't volunteering, doing something that was his passion. He just because he wanted it to come to him before he created. Yes, but what he did instead was he desired to create. He went ahead and did what he desired, even though he didn't get paid. And eventually, he did it so well because he was the only person who doing it with passion, <laughs> that a job was created for him. And that's what can happen to every person. And now he's doing exactly what he wants, exactly the job he loves. He loves going to work every day. You don't have to set an alarm clock for Tristan in the morning <laughs> to go to work. He loves going to work every day. He's ready to go to work. He often stays late. He often does some on the weekends as well because he loves doing it. He loves working with, with the kids that are involved and he enjoys it in, immensely. Now, so two years later, after he went through all these different emotions and he had to go through all these feelings about why things weren't coming to him, he went through this real powerless stage where he felt like he had no power to create anything. He went through this place where he attacked himself because he didn't have a qualification and he felt he was stupid because he didn't have qualification and he felt all through that. And after he dealt with all those feelings, he embraced a process which created like of volunteering his time and that created a job that now he's in enjoying immensely. Does that make sense? But he had to go through the process. Yep. How did he come to start the process? Um, we, myself and my sons talk quite frequently about the soul and what it creates. So quite a, a few years ago, it uh, would be now probably four years ago, I started talking to Tristan about, because he wanted to talk about it and not before then, I started talking to him about what he was creating in his life and why. And he could see that it was to do with things that were going on inside of himself that he was creating these things. And so he started to address the emotions as to why he was creating these things from his emotional perspective. And once he started doing that, things started to change. Before then, he was living at home still with me. Um, he was expecting me to, to provide. provide everything for him. Um, and one of the things I did at that time was I said, no, you have to move out. Right. So, so he was confronted with the emotions he felt towards me about why he was still there, why he was still living there. So... He had a lot of confronting emotions to work his way through, but then he got to a stage where he recognised, if I follow my desire with passion and I don't care about the money and I don't care about what's going to come, that, that something's going to happen. And sure enough, within a few months, he did that. Now, during the time when he was following his desire and volunteering his time, all sorts of things happened. One time he got beaten up by one of the... By, by a boyfriend of one of the students he was looking after. Like, he got uh, punched and, uh, and, he, and he had to charge the guy with assault and all sorts of things happened. But he still went through the emotions of it all. Does that make sense? Totally. Yeah. And once he went through the emotions of it all, now, once you deal with more and more, 
you start it, your soul starts becoming so powerful that you just attract what you want without effort. Right? So he didn't have to go looking for a job in a different town. He didn't have to go somewhere. He just decided that was where he wanted to live and this was the job he wanted to do. And so he voluntarily did it and eventually it got created. So he was standing on the crossroads, but you actually gave him the little push which road to go down and then it all... I didn't give him a push as to which road to Apart go down. Apart from suggesting I just told home. him that he couldn't come down this road anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Does yeah. that make sense? He could go down any other, <laughs> not this one anymore. But, but yeah. also, uh, AJ was very, um, as he is with his sons, he, he took a lot of responsibility for the error that he'd created in Tristan. He said, mm. I've been supporting you for all these years. This and that's is not my loving. Error. I've done something... Mm bad for you son (laughs) so we're going to have to I'm going to have to stop this because it's not loving and it's going to bring up emotions for you and Tris would tell you he got angry for a while he was like of course he thought he should get it he'd been given it all his life and then he felt like no this doesn't feel good dad and I you know and he had to be he had to be really humble to those like emotions he felt them and he got angry and and I I had to risk my son not loving me yeah yeah and just yeah, I had to risk that he didn't love me for a while. Yeah, yeah. and and if, if, and if I invested, love him, I will do yeah. that. Yeah. But if he, if he was invested with Tristan, still thinking he's a great dad the whole time, it wouldn't have worked. Yeah, yeah. does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so um, yeah, I didn't try to push my son in any direction. All I just said is I am no longer going to support him doing what he's doing. I mean, financially. He had to create his own desire. Through his own desire, he had to address the issue. I'm perfectly happy with Tristan being a garbage collector or a social worker, as he currently is, or any other person he desires to be. He will always have my love. But I am not happy if he's going to rely on me the rest of his life to have happiness, because in the end he won't be happy doing that, and he also won't be proud of himself doing that. Many times we do things in our own lives that we're not proud of, eh? And um, and then we expect to be happy with ourselves after doing something we're not proud of, and we can't be. (laughs) We have to change what we do if we wish to be proud of ourselves and have a sense of ourselves and a sense of our will. All right, I feel like everyone's had enough. Is that how everyone is? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so we're, we're going to... Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll be around tomorrow we'll be afternoon. Tomorrow if you, want to, uh, if you want to come along tomorrow afternoon. Uh, about one thirty. is that okay with you guys? Uh, one thirty, maybe to five, five or something like that. Um, Tomorrow, if you want to come along, and tomorrow um, I'd love to talk more with you about desire and uh, and how it actually works, you know, in terms of desire. But uh, also, if in the interim any of you feel brave enough to actually talk to your spirit friends, because it, it seems to be a fair bit of reticence about that still, <laughs> and we'd be happy to do that tomorrow as well. So, so either or. And some of you I know have got questions of me about earth change events too that you might wish to ask. And I'll be happy to answer some of those questions tomorrow for you if you want. Um, So can we leave it there? Is that okay? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.